Living Faith, how are you? So good to be here with you today. The Lord woke us up again. I was thinking about that this morning. Our God is so, so good. So great to be here with you. And we are here to lift our voices and hearts to Jesus, the one who wins every battle. And he does, he is victorious. So I just wanna welcome you to Living Faith. I'm so glad that you are here. And I just wanna give you a special welcome if it's your first time. Please stop by the Connection Center. We have a free gift we'd love to give to you. And most of all, we'd love to meet you for the very first time and welcome you to our church family. So October 8th is coming up, and that's our prayer night. It's gonna be from 7 to 7.30 p.m. We'll have a time of individual prayer, and the prayer team will be available. And then after that, we'll have worship, a testimony, and a time of group prayer. So it starts at 7. You're gonna wanna be there. It's gonna be a great opportunity to stop and pray for our country, pray for our world, pray for our town, pray for all the different things that are on our hearts, and lift up our prayers to Jesus. And we know that he hears our prayers so take that opportunity this Tuesday. It's gonna be wonderful. I'm also thrilled to introduce our newest ministry to you called Better Together. It's for those ages 36 to 59, and it starts this Wednesday, October 9th at 7 p.m., and you do not wanna miss this. It's a place to gather as a larger group with others your age. This is the first time we have a place for our small groups and others who are not in a group, to come together as one. Don't miss this opportunity, it's gonna be amazing. Being a part of a community that is rooted in Christ and fellowship is essential to your walk with Christ, it is. We hope to see you there and more info could be found in the compass, but definitely check it out this week if you are in that age bracket. I'm also excited to announce our fall women's event. It's called Harvesting Grace is coming up very soon too. It's gonna to be on Saturday, October 19th, and there'll be a time of fellowship, worship, lunch, and also a fun craft. Don't forget to bring a friend though, this is really important, and come celebrate God's abundant grace in every season. So register as soon as possible at lfcc.org women and read more about that in the compass. But don't miss that opportunity, it's gonna be fantastic. Psalm 24, one, and I love the Psalms. It says this, the earth is the Lord's, it sure is, and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. So each time we give our tithes and offerings, if it's in the boxes in the back or online, it's an act of worship. It's an act of stewardship because honestly, he's the true owner of it all. He owns it all. So would you join me for a prayer? Father, we thank you so, so much that we could gather in this place once again. And Jesus, I do. I thank you for waking me up again, for giving me another chance at life. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us life and Jesus for saving our lives. And Jesus, I thank you for getting us through this week, for helping us through and Jesus, for all the times that we called on you, Jesus, and you helped us, you delivered us, you gave us strength, and you gave us hope, and you helped us push on through. We thank you for those moments, and we thank you, Jesus, for being there. And Jesus, I know that the battle belongs to you, Lord. And Jesus, we ask that you fight our battles and Jesus, I ask that your will be done. Your will be done in my life. Your will be done in our lives. For Jesus, you know better. better. So we lay down our sword and we ask Jesus that you fight our battles. And once again, Lord, that your will be done. And Jesus, there's so many fears that come to my mind at times. And I become fearful. And I know each of us do sometimes, Lord and we just lay our fears at your feet and we trust you, God. And whom then shall we fear? You're the God of angel armies and you are with us and we can trust you. So increase my faith, increase our faith to trust you. And Lord, we know that you are our fortress 
And God, I'm gonna keep running to you. I'm gonna keep running to my fortress because God, I have no other place to go. And you are our fortress for your people. And we are your people. And we're gonna run to you, Jesus. And Lord, as, as we prepare our hearts right now to worship you in spirit and in truth, we lay everything down, God. We lay it all down. We want to be free to worship you in spirit and truth in here. And we're going to give you all the glory and all the praise. And Jesus, we thank you for the cross. And we have so much to be thankful for, Lord. So we're going to praise you with everything that we got. And we thank you, Lord, for all that we have is yours. Our lives, our future, everything, God. So we give you the glory in this place and we're gonna worship you. Thank you, Jesus, once again for saving us. I pray this in Jesus' name and everyone said? Amen. 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 Psalm 21, 13 says, Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. He is a powerful, mighty God. So I invite you to stand and we're gonna worship him together today.
he's alive. So let's sing his praises louder. Are you ready? I'll sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. I'll sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. I'll sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. I'll sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. I'll sing a little louder. Oh, louder than the other I'll sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. I'll sing a little louder. Heaven calls to fight for me. I'll sing a little louder. In the presence of my enemies. I'll sing a little louder. Oh, louder than the unbelief. I'll sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody. I'll sing a little louder. And heaven comes to fight for me. Sing a little louder. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of. Yes, we can raise that hallelujah and worship him and glorify him. And we know that he's the God of victories. So in those storms, we can go to him. But you know, he doesn't just have your back. He's not just a God that has your back. He's a God that fights for you in the battle. Let's continue to worship him together.
Lord God, we thank you that we could stand here and praise you because you have the victory. You have delivered the victory for us, Lord God, through your son, Jesus. You've parted the waters in our lives, Lord. We could look back at all those storms. We thank you for carrying us, leading us through the deep. Lord, we, we've been studying about faith, Lord, and, and hearing from you and reading about all these examples of faith in your word. And Lord, we know you've also done those things in our lives. So thank you, Lord God. And now, Lord, as we continue to study your word, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, open our hearts, our minds, to understand, to hear from you. Speak to us, we pray, so we can continue to grow in faith in you, so we can continue to follow you as you would lead us. Have your hand on Pastor Scott as he delivers the message you've prepared for us to hear today, Lord God. And we'll raise a hallelujah to you again and again and again because you are the one true God and worthy of all the praise and glory and honor. To you alone be glory. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Good morning, beautiful people. Please open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29 through 40. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 29 through 40. If you do not have a Bible, please look up at the screen. We will provide the words for you. Here is God's word. <clears throat> By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time had failed me to tell you, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies in flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again for a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn, sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in the deserts and mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, there should, there should not be made perfect. They should not be made perfect. Thank you, for, thank you, Lord God, for your word as a gift. And please be seated. There you go. <laughs> so good to be here. Man. Right? I don't know if you saw him, but Pastor Mark is over here right behind my wife, so. Isn't it good to see his face? Mark is one of those people that just shines the light of Jesus Christ in, in his face and the way he communicates just his presence, so. Make sure you say hi to uh, Pastor Mark if you're able to. Um, I'm sure he'd appreciate that. Don't all like swamp him at once, but it'd be nice for you to to say hi to him. Also, really grateful to be here, really uh, hopeful that some or many of you will come tonight to our business meeting. So that's, you know, it's for our members to come and hear things and vote. There's a vote tonight that's pretty important. Uh, but also, um, I'm going to spend about 25 minutes just talking through a vision for what I think we think, it's more than just me, the Lord is leading us to do over these next three years or so. And so if you're a member, it's really important for you to hear that, to know that, so we can get all aligned around that. 
Uh, as well, though, if you're not a member, you know, you can, you can go to a business meeting. It's not for members only. Uh, if you're not a member, you can't vote, but you can enjoy the experience of fellowship and also just hearing uh, some reports and that particular vision. So I'd love for you to be there if you can. That's tonight at six. Well, a man uh, slipped and fell off a cliff as he was walking on a mountain, but thank the Lord he, he was able to grasp onto a branch with two hands as he was falling. It was a really sturdy branch on the side of a, of a cliff uh, area. Uh, he looked up and he saw it was 20 feet from where he had fallen, and it was down 100, well, 1,500 feet, long ways down, 15 stories or so or whatever that would be, 150 stories. And he was panicked. So he started yelling, of course, wouldn't you do this? He's, he's yelling, help, help, somebody help me. And wouldn't you know it, a booming voice spoke up and said, I'm here. I will save you if you believe in me. And the man who's hanging for dear life on the branch yelled back, I believe, I believe. He said, if you believe in me, let go of the branch, and then I will save you. And the man, hearing that voice, looked up at the 20 feet, looked back down at the 1,500 feet below, and he said, yell, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> Do you ever feel that way with the Lord? You know, maybe you wouldn't say to the Lord, is there anybody else up there? But haven't you said to the Lord, I have, is there any other word from you other than this word? Because this word is hard. This message I'm hearing from you is difficult. Can I get another one? Some of us walked in here feeling like that. We have weak faith that needs strengthening or we're facing something so difficult. We have strong faith. We just don't have the faith it takes to face that head on. Perhaps you've walked in here and you don't have faith yet at all. You're sort of checking out the Christian thing and you're wondering who God is and maybe today's the day that you would know God's real. He's here. He's alive. He beats sin, death, and hell for all of us. And all he invites us to do is to have faith in him, his son. Others of us feel like we're ready to let go of that branch anytime God says to do it. By the way, Mark Lidecker is that kind of guy. No matter where you're in that faith journey, we're asking God right now and during this season of our church's life to increase our trust in him, that we would live by faith in Jesus, that each and every day we would wake up and we would look to him and trust him more, rely on him more uh, with our very lives, that no matter how weak or strong our faith is, we wouldn't see it just as a decision we'd, make, we'd made in the past, but that it's an active part of our daily uh, life in the, in the present. Uh, this sermon series called Living Faith this fall, we started with having a definition of Christian faith. I defined it simply as relying on the person and the work and the promises of uh, Jesus Christ. It involves reward, for sure, and it precedes our understanding. The last three weeks have been really interesting, haven't they? We looked at these numerous examples of faith that are in Hebrews chapter 11. It's, it's sort of relentless, by faith, by faith, by faith, and all these People, there's lessons to be learned in these definitions of faith. There's also lessons to be learned in uh, people who display faith. And you know, God teaches us through his word and the scriptures, but doesn't God also teach you through the lives of each other as we see how other people express their faith and live by faith? We're encouraged and we're also learning about how to walk by faith. In the weeks to come, we're gonna be moving from this chapter to some other scripture verses and we conclude today in Hebrews chapter 11 with three lessons from the nation of Israel as a whole. And there's some specific names mentioned in verses 29 through 40, 
But they're written there to be a summary of the faith of all of God's people, really, for all time. They trusted God, all these people did, the whole nation, in fact, in certain ways, and it, that faith changed the course of their lives. And the Lord wants us to learn from them, that we might look to his word and have open hearts to receive his word so that we might have the same kind of faith. So three lessons from the nation of Israel and their faith. First, I want you to see, number one, notice, faith seeks protection from God in this world. So being a Christian means that you pursue the Lord for your defense. You look to him. That doesn't mean you refrain from taking practical steps to to protect yourself, by the way. That's not a bad thing. God often uses means in our world to protect us even means that we employ. So it's, you know, it's good to have an alarm system for your house. That's not a bad thing, is it? Do you lock your doors? Yeah, I mean, you can lock your doors. You can protect yourself if you're under duress or harm is coming your way. You can can own a firearm. You can take precautionary measures. But here's the thing. In all you do, as you do it, your heart is always geared heavenward to ask the Lord to be your defense through whatever practical measures you're employing as well as well beyond those. Don't you ask that God for that? Even when I lock the door, I still pray at night, God, protect our house. Protect our family, you know? Protect our church. Protect your people. Well, look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 29 through 31, where there's faith in the Lord to be the shield and the defender. It says, by faith, The people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Now, the details of these events are in uh, Exodus chapter 14, Joshua chapter 2, and Joshua chapter 6, if you want to look them up later uh, and read about them. In verse 29 in Hebrews 11 there, that's about Exodus 14, when Moses led God's people out of slavery in Egypt. The Egyptian army followed them, and when they got to the Red Sea, God miraculously opened it up, and his people, who had trusted him to this point, walked in continued trust in him across the dry land. And then the Egyptians followed them, and God put the sea back to normal, killing them, saving his people. So Israel, in that case, of course, lived by faith. God led them all the way out of Egypt to the edge of that sea, to the point where they were really sitting ducks, totally vulnerable, had nowhere to go in their minds. The only way... To go was not forward, but back, and they must have had doubts about God in that moment, right? Even the scripture talks about some doubts that were in them. They were trapped, nowhere to go. The only thing they had was to turn back and fight an unwinnable war. But God miraculously opened that path, and he protected them from harm. They trusted him and walked that path. They lived by faith, and they were saved. And did you notice in the scriptures, the opposite was true of the Egyptians. They did not trust God, they did not trust his word, and they perished. God told them to let his people go. And that was a a word from God to them that they would trust him in this, that they would be able to operate as a nation without those slaves, that God didn't want the slavery. He wanted them to be freed. They didn't trust God, Not only did they doubt his word, they didn't believe it, and they rebelled against him, and they died. You know, God has different paths for us all. You you have a path. You know, your path isn't my path. Everybody has a path. And God leads us on those paths, and he protects us, and we follow And sometimes that that way of uh, protection will be normal. Sometimes it'll be supernatural. In either case, know this, it is God who defends you. It is God who protects you. 
Trust him, trust his path, follow him, and look to him to be your defender. Verse 30 is about Joshua. If you don't know the story, God led Israel into the promised land. Jericho was an important city to defeat in that effort to get to the promised land. And the challenge was that it was extremely fortified. So the walls were 13 feet high, and they had a 28-foot watchtower. Seems pathetic to us today, doesn't it? I mean, I don't know how high the ceilings are in here. Certainly higher than 13 feet. But 13-foot wall in that day was impenetrable. And God instructed Joshua to lead God's army, his people, with the Ark of the Covenant and seven priests and to march around the city each day for six days. And then on that seventh day, to march around the city seven times to blast their horns and also at the same time everyone was to shout. Now that must have seemed absurd, right? What are we doing that for? That's crazy talk. That's pointless behavior. That's bad military strategy. Totally illogical. But the people had faith. They had faith in God's word to do what it says, to follow him, and he would protect them during the process. And guess what? The walls came tumbling down, just like God said they would. And they took the city in victory. You know, sometimes God will direct you to do something that will be very wise in your eyes. You'll think, this makes total sense, Lord. Thank you for your wisdom, God. This is absolutely what we should do. Makes total sense. I'm going to do it. Other times, he will tell you to do something that seems absurd. You'll say to yourself, what? No way. Why would I do that? It's totally illogical. It makes no sense. You know, during those times, doesn't it require a little more faith? Like, if you can figure it out and it's all wise in your eyes and makes sense, where's the faith in that? Sometimes God provides you those situations that seem illogical because he wants you to trust him. So do it. Trust him. And in either case, always remember that it's God who defends you. In verse 31, that's about Joshua. It was before the victory of Jericho. Uh, Joshua sent spies in the land before they did the circling and the walls coming tumbling down. Joshua sent spies into the land to check out the city. And this woman named Rahab let them stay in her brothel, a house of ill repute. And someone saw the spies going into the house and reported that back to the king. So the king confronted Rahab to see who was in the house, and she hid and she protected uh, the the men. Why did she do that? Well, it it was because of her faith. It was because she heard about the Red Sea. (laughs) And she believed in her heart of hearts that this God wasn't just the God of Israel, this God was the God of the universe, the Lord of heaven and earth who was leading this, this people. And she trusted in him. She knew that the city of Jericho would fall and belong to him and his people. She believed God's word. And at the risk of her own life, she protected those spies. And because of that faith, God protected her. The Lord saved her and her family. And isn't this wonderful news to you when you read this about Rahab, the prostitute? Isn't it fantastic news? Just think about it. The list of the champions of faith throughout all of history written in the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 11 includes this woman, a former enemy of the Lord, a Gentile who worked as a prostitute and was considered an outcast. Isn't that good news in your heart? Are you getting what that means for your own life? Oh, It means anybody can come to the Lord. Anybody. I think this is in here in part and parcel for to encourage all of us, especially those of us who've done so much wrong, feel so unrighteous, so unworthy, that God assures us that you too can belong to me. You can be my child, God says, right? That all you need is faith. It doesn't matter what your past was. Sure, you would have consequences from your past, but it doesn't preclude you, it doesn't exclude you from being right with God, because that's by faith. Credible mercy. 
incredible grace. So trust him. And I wonder, what are you afraid of? You know, I find fear lurking in my heart. A variety of things. What, what potential harm gives you cause for alarm? What evil forces out there are you worried about that are going to hurt you or those that you love? You know, the safest place anyone could possibly be is knowing what God says to be true and trusting him and following him along the path that he lays for us. No matter how dangerous it looks, no matter how much harm it provides, the safest place to be is trusting God. Take him at his word, live by faith. Faith seeks God's protection in this world. Also, number two, second, notice that faith is worth more than the whole world. So us relying on Jesus has more value than the sum total of the United States' GDP or the Dow Jones Industrial Average. You, believe this, you trusting in Jesus is way better than Jeff Bezos emptying his bank account into your. I'm not sure we believe this. <laughs> if Jeff Bezos called you up today and said, hey, give me your, your account number, give me your routing number, I got something to give you, I'm gonna give you all I have, one condition, you have no faith in Jesus. See, our belief in the Lord to do everything he said he would do is more beneficial than owning the whole universe. Jesus himself says, for what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? So faith doesn't buy a better life here. It does something much more valuable than that. Faith guarantees us the best life in eternity and also the best relationship with the best being now and forevermore. So look at the examples of faith in Israel. The author just sort of rattles them all off, starting in verse 32, so we could feel the full effect of this truth. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. So this summary here at the beginning of verse 30. Two, it's the author's way of saying, you know, is there a need to say more? You know, I'm going to give you a bunch, but I, I can't keep writing about this because the list goes on and on and on and on. It'd be impossible to cover the subject of God's people trusting in God for God to deliver them in their situations, protect them, and carry them through. He has to restrain his pen. The, the mention is six men and then the prophets in general and some women. And the whole point is to cover the entire community of faith that has existed uh, before this. Notice then, too, faith sometimes has remarkable results in this world. Did you see that when we read it? Jephthah, if you don't know the stories, conquered the Ammonites. It's a good result. Barak enforced justice in defeating the Canaanites. David obtained the promise of God, that's about him, to become king. Daniel stopped the mouths of lions when he was thrown into their den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego quenched the power of fire 
in the furnace. Elijah escaped the sword of Jezebel after defeating her prophets of Baal. Gideon was made into a strong army out of just 300 men. Samson, don't you love this story? He became mighty in war, killing a thousand enemies with the jawbone of a donkey. The Shunammite woman received her son back from the dead by the healing hand of Elijah. All these people, they battled overwhelming odds, and through it all, they trusted in God. They had little chance of success, and yet the results are incredibly positive. All of that by faith. That can happen to you too. You can trust God, and some powerful, encouraging, amazing things can happen in your life on a daily basis. And yet do you also notice faith doesn't guarantee comfort in this world? That's in the scripture here too. It's amazing. It's these, these high mountainous experience on the mountaintop with God type things. And also at the same time, people in the desert, right? Struggling. Do you notice that there? Sometimes Faith led the people of God to be tortured, mocked, flogged, imprisoned, stoned, sawed in half, killed with a sword, poor, troubled, persecuted, homeless. You see that faith is this mixed bag of outcomes here on earth. Sometimes incredible results, sometimes absolutely awful experiences. Get that clear in your mind. That's a really important principle from the scriptures. Faith doesn't always result in wonderful things. Sometimes the results are very difficult. But the point of the scripture is whatever faith brings, it's clear that those who have the faith have that which is most valuable in the world. See, to the societies they lived in, most of these people of faith Mentioned in Hebrews 11, they were insignificant, unimportant. The world didn't think much of them at all, but the reality was totally different. God said the world was not worthy of them. Why? Why was the world not worthy of them? Was it because they were so virtuous? Was it because they were so talented? Was it because they had all this experience and this personality and this charisma? Was it all the things that the world says are important? No, it was only one thing. Faith. Because of their faith. Isn't that encouraging to your own heart? I'm a nobody. How about you? I I mean, I'm worse than a nobody in certain ways as I think about my past. And yet God says, God says, I can be included, you can be included in his book of whom the world is not worthy. How? By trusting in his word, by having faith in his son. So as you look at your life and you you compare it to other people, you notice you don't have much or you don't have all that you want, realize you have the most important thing if you have faith. You have that which is most valuable. You you have right relationship with Almighty God. You're enjoying the best being there is, and you will do so more and more forevermore. It's incredible. Faith seeks God's protection in the world. Faith is worth more than this whole world. Third and lastly on this topic, faith wants better than this world. So being a Christian inherently means wanting something more than whatever this existence can provide us. So when you trust in God, you're not primarily trusting in him for something better here, though he may provide that, but you're primarily trusting in him to deliver you from here to something that's much better in the future. Look at Hebrews 11, the end of it, verses 39 through 40. And all these though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So every person mentioned there in Hebrews chapter 11 did receive something for their faith. It had a result on earth, some incredible, some 
challenging, but there was a result from their faith. Also, they received the commendation of God. So God was like, yes, my guy, my gal. That was God commending them for their faith. So that, that's amazing. But none of them, it says, received all that God had uh, promised. They lived and they died and they didn't get all God said they would get. In fact, do you know this? They aren't even getting all that God said they would get right now in heaven. You see that little phrase? That's what that phrase means. Apart from us, they should not be made perfect. That's what it means. It takes a bit of explaining, I think. I'm so glad for the thief on the cross, aren't you? And Jesus told him, today you'll be with me in paradise. Like, you, you know, you're on the cross right now. You're gonna, your, your eyes are going to close, breathe your last, and then you're in paradise. Today. Uh, the Apostle Paul said something similar. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. In other words, when we die, we go to be in God's presence. When a person who is a Christian breathes their last, they're in the Lord's presence in heaven. But did you know this? Heaven's not the final destination. So those who are there right now, if you can picture them in your mind's eye, they got it good. For sure. And do you know they're going to get more even in the future? They haven't yet received all they've been promised. That's what it says in the scripture here. It's a focus not just on what they were experiencing on earth. They didn't get all they received. It's even a focus on now. They're not yet receiving all that God has promised. See, Jesus promised to return from heaven to put the whole world right once and for all. He's going to usher in justice and purity and glory. See, Christ is going to right everything wrong that you've ever done, every wrong that's been done to you, everything wrong within you, and even everything wrong with the whole world. And all that will happen when Jesus fulfills his promise to return to earth, to create this new heavens and the new earth, to resurrect all of us. This world is going away, folks. Jesus has a new and perfect world coming our way. So the people listed in Hebrews 11 who have died, you know, they haven't yet reached their perfect destination because that involves us being with them too and Jesus having returned to put the whole world right regarding sin. And think about this now. If the people who are in heaven right now, as you think about them, I mean, they're in a way better world than we're in right now, but they're longing for an even better place. If that's true, how much more should we here on earth want a better world? Are you getting that? If Abel and Noah and Moses and Abraham and Jacob and David and the Christian that you love who's died and gone to heaven, if all of them are up there right now being like, this is awesome, but you know what? We can't wait until Jesus returns and transforms the universe. We're going with him. We're getting resurrected bodies. We're going to see everybody else get resurrected. The whole universe is going to be transformed. See, that's part of what faith is. If they're saying that, how much more ought we who live in this world? Like, we, we get glimpses of hell in this world, don't we? How much more should we groan? How much more should we be at the edge of our seat waiting for this to happen, to cheer it on, to pray for it, to long for it? That's part of what faith is. It wants better than this world. You see, there's an error in thinking about faith as God being good to me in this life, strictly in terms of my circumstances. That's not really what faith is. Faith longs for a better future. And you, there's nothing wrong with wanting something better in this world now. That's not inherently wrong. I like my life now. There are things I'd like it to be different and better. How about you? There's things I would prefer to have in the future that I don't have now. There are situations I'd like to be in that I don't have now. There are better thoughts in my mind about what it could be now. Don't you have this too for the next generation? Like you think, oh, I want my kids and grandkids. And even if you don't have those, you just want the next generation to have a better life than we're having now. There's nothing wrong with any of that. That's not sinful. That's not bad. It's just that faith is more than that, right? Faith, the life that pleases God, acknowledges that this is not our home. Even if we get something better, 
it still stinks compared to what we got coming, right? There's no utopia here. That's the next world, right? That's what faith is all about. One day we'll receive all that he has promised. One day we'll be made perfect, body and soul and relationships and world. And the point of Hebrews chapter 11 is that that faith should make a difference. That kind of faith should make a difference in how we live now. If we really believe that God has a destination for us in a world that makes this world pale in comparison we're trusting him now to deliver us into that world through our death or upon Christ's return, shouldn't this chapter of our lives be different than like our neighbor who doesn't believe that? You know, we know we're inadequate to be called heroes of the faith. Aren't you glad that God doesn't demand that we become adequate? He simply says, trust me. That's what he wants. If you analyze all the people in Hebrews, you'll find that they were just like us in all sorts of ways. They were not impressive people. They simply trusted an impressive God. So let's step out in faith like them and demonstrate our faith by wanting a better world, both now and forevermore. Well, in the 20th century, a New Testament professor was taken into custody by communist authorities. It's a true story. They subjected this guy to intense persecution. It was a miracle that he survived. They put him in a cell that was only about four feet by five feet in dimension. Like, so I couldn't even, like, lay down. He couldn't either. He couldn't stretch out or exercise in any way. Uh, his light in that cell was kept on at all times, flickering, and it was out of his reach in a, you know, mesh steel, so he couldn't get at it. He couldn't take it out. So he didn't really even know what time of day or night it was. He didn't know how much time had passed that he was incarcerated. They would only let him sleep uh, for two or three hours. So when he was able to sleep with that light on, and he started to fall asleep. They would only let him sleep a little bit of, of time. In fact, they would at random intervals just come in just randomly. So he didn't know what, you know, I mean, he couldn't really tell time, but they'd put a, this like steel cylinder on top of his head and they would slam it with a hammer and they, so that he would lose his hearing. I mean, he pretty much became deaf. They, they fed him very sparingly. They gave him food just at the right time so that he would just have just enough to survive, but almost starving. He was on the edge of starvation all the time. And all they wanted was a signed confession that he didn't believe in Jesus. That's what they wanted. And that he was teaching a religion that was an opiate for the people. The fatigue and confusion began to take a toll on this man's life, and he had this moment where he looked up to heaven and he, and he thought, God, you, you'll forgive me, won't you? God, you'll understand. I can't take it anymore. If I, if I sign, you'll understand, right? Not long after that, his cell was filled with a light far more brilliant than the electric bulb. Do you believe in the supernatural? That's a true story. He saw no one, but he knew it was the God revealing himself in a way that he hadn't, in an unusual way, the very presence of God. He heard no sound, but he had the sense of God's presence in a different way. And the Lord's voice was clear to him from the scripture he had memorized. Here's what impressed upon his heart in that moment. It was, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The following morning, this man said it was though he had a full night's sleep. His body was refreshed, his mind was new and sharp when the tormentors came. He not only stood up to their questions, but he felt this increased sense of love for him, a supernatural love that he hadn't had before, and even preached short messages to them while they were beating him into silence about the good news of Jesus Christ. He knew, he said, that no matter what happened to him, God was going to win. A few days later, he was suddenly released. He said he could hardly believe his eyes when he walked out. It was like a whole surreal dream as he walked through the town. 
And his students thought he was like a miracle. This man of apostolic sort of power, this firebrand of a preacher. And they praised him. But he gave all the glory to God for meeting him in that cell that one day. So I wonder, are you in need of a fresh encounter with God today? Remember, he speaks through his word. This book is supernatural. He has words for you in here that he will impress on your heart to meet your greatest needs when you need it. May you seek protection from him. May you trust him, even through the pain you're going through. And may you bring him great glory as you have that kind of faith, the faith that wants better than this world, the faith that's worth more than the whole world, faith like that professor, faith like the people in Hebrews chapter 11. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we give you praise for being such a great and awesome and wonderful God. We proclaim in our hearts that you are God and there is no other, that you're, you're indeed the Lord of heaven and earth. And we cry out to you now, Lord. We, we cry out to you from our pain, from our suffering, from our doubt. We cry out to you even from places of unbelief. Lord, hear our prayers. We're anxious, we're fearful, we're worried. And we need you. We need to hear from you, to know the right way to go. And we need to trust you, and we want to. We just need more power to do so. So give us the strength to follow you with all our hearts. We do it for Jesus for his sake, for his glory. In his name we pray, amen. Let's worship together.
Please be seated. Well, welcome to the time of communion here called the Lord's Supper, where we take time once a month at the end of the first Sunday of the month, the service, to, to do something that Jesus told us to do. He ordained this practice, this, this ceremony. It was his idea, and he wants us to participate in it. And he calls everyone who does participate in it to make sure that they have faith. So at Living Faith, we don't, you know, we celebrate open communion. You don't have to be a member here to participate. But we do want you to know that Jesus himself says that he wants you to have faith in order to participate. And this is actually really good news, isn't it? You know, sometimes we get this idea in our head, which is actually quite insidious, it's definitely false, that we shouldn't take communion because we, we had a really bad week, you know, like morally. Like we, we, we sinned last week, we, we really messed up last week, we feel totally unholy, we're not even sure we should be in church kind of feeling, therefore we're not going to take communion. You know, when you have those kind of weeks, that's the week you most need communion. That's the week that God says definitely take communion because you need to remember that Jesus paid it all, right? So the, the bread and the cup communicate his body and his blood given for us. If you have children, if there are children in the house, we love kids, don't we? And we just trust parents that you would guide your children in when they're ready to receive communion, when they're ready to participate, when they have faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. And, and you know, Jesus himself said that we need faith like little children. So make sure that any experience or expression of faith that you see in kids, you affirm, you encourage, you support, you celebrate. And we trust you as parents to make that decision for them. Let's take a minute now and quiet minute at our seats. And there's a lot of things you can do during this time and feel free to do whatever you'd like. I just want to encourage you to remember that the scripture says that we use this time to remember Jesus. Sure, you'll think of your sin. Sure, you'll think of your inadequacies. Sure, you'll think of your, yourself, your fears, whatever. But remember to think about who Jesus is. And especially in light of Hebrews chapter 11, maybe think about the Lord and what is he communicating to you that he wants you to trust him with? Is there something, is there a relationship? Is there something you're supposed to do? Look to Jesus now. Quiet time between you and him. Well, in Matthew 26, verse 26, there's some words about what we're doing. It reads, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So Father in heaven, we ask you to bless this bread that's in all of our hands, that we would take this and eat it and be nourished by all that you are for us, God, 
in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Verse goes on to read, and it's uh, in Matthew 26, verses 27 through 28, about this cup. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So, Lord, we thank you for this cup that we're holding. Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you poured out your blood, Jesus, for me, for us, for our sins. Help us to really believe, to have faith that we're forgiven. Pray that in Jesus' name. Lift your cup. Well, thank you for joining us today. We're so glad you're here. May God continue to bless you this week. You know, faith and peace are connected. Faith is really, or peace is really faith applied to our sense and need for justice in the world. About peace, Romans 15, makes it clear who's in charge of peace. It says, may the God of peace be with you all. May you go this week and experience that deep inner peace of being forgiven for your sins and spread the peace of Jesus, would you? In any way you can this week. Amen.